Our sermon this morning is entitled, They Will Persecute You Also, and it is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, starting in verse 18, through chapter 16, verse 15. The followers of Jesus are to love each other, as we saw last week. One of the reasons that they will need to love one another is that the world is going to hate them. In this week's text, we are going to see Jesus warn his disciples of what is to come, and he is going to tell them of the help that he is going to send to them. This morning, we're going to see one of the consistent themes in Christianity, that Christians find love in the church and hatred in the world. Let's pray together as we begin to look at God's word. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to come this morning to look into the gospel of John and to hear your word, to look at your words and allow them to change our life. Father, I pray that you would not allow me to be a distraction, that you would allow your word to go forth and to accomplish that which you have intended for it to accomplish this morning. Father, may our time this morning bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Join with me, if you will, in chapter 15 of the Gospel of John, verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what was written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. You also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. We're going to pause there at the conclusion of chapter 15 to look at what has been said in these past few verses. And and I think the first thing and the most striking thing in these verses is that the world hated Jesus, the world will hate Jesus' followers. And that is us, church. The world hates us because we do not belong to it. We belong to Jesus. Jesus says, if they persecute the Master... What will they do to the servants? The master is greater than the servants, right? The master is is due of of glory and and dignity and any honor. The master is due that, not the servants. And if they kill the master, if they persecute the master, what are they going to do to the servants who are worth much less than the master? That's the point Jesus is getting across there. He goes on to explain that by hating Jesus. If they hate Jesus, they also hate the Father. And of course, we're talking about God the Father. If they're hating Jesus, they are hating the Father as well. And Jesus tells us near the end of this little section that both the Spirit and the followers of Jesus, Jesus' followers must testify about Him and that the Spirit will come and testify about Him as well. We're going to come back to these points, keep those in mind, and pick up with me in verse 1 of chapter 16. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you 
will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is good for you, or it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will, prov- he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. We'll pause there and have just a few verses left to look at. But let's let's see what Jesus has said in the first 11 verses of chapter 16. He reveals, Jesus reveals why he is telling his disciples this information. Why he is telling them about the persecution that is coming and the hatred that is going to come directed at them. He wants them to remain steadfast. As we saw last week, he wants them to remain in him. He is the true vine. They have to stay connected to him if they want to be fruitful, if they don't want to be pruned off and cut off and cast away. They have to remain in him. Those who will persecute them will think that they are doing God's will, but they are not. Keep that in mind, church. Uh, it, it, there's a time that Jesus' followers are going to be persecuted, and those who are persecuting them will think they're doing God a favor. Now, we're going to see this fulfilled very shortly after the resurrection, historically, but I think throughout history, we do see times, and we see them even now, where people put Christians to death and think they are doing it as God's will. So keep that in mind as we're looking through this passage. Jesus says they will persecute them because they do not know God. They think they're doing God's will, but really they don't know God. Because if they did, they would be Jesus' followers. They wouldn't be persecuting them. Jesus also tells his disciples that it is good for him to leave so that the Holy Spirit or the Advocate can come. And we've talked about this a little bit. We've already mentioned the idea that because Jesus uh, is enfleshed, he has a flesh and bone body, he can only be in one place at a time, and that the universal, uh, the Holy Spirit universalizes Jesus' ministry and makes him able to be in, in present to all of us. And we'll talk about that in a moment again. So it's good for him to leave, although we probably wouldn't, if we were in the disciples' shoes, we'd say, what do you mean you're leaving? How can that be good? We can understand that they must be confused about this and don't realize until afterwards that Jesus was right. Jesus also claims about the Holy Spirit that he will show the truth about three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's look at those for just a moment together right now. Sin, Jesus says uh, in verse 9, about sin because people do not believe in me. Rejecting Jesus is sin and is the result of sin. The Jews should accept Jesus. They should accept his teachings. He's performed the signs. He's proven who he is. But they will not. Remember where we're talking about in the timeline of the Gospel of John, very shortly Jesus is going to be on trial and the Jews are going to be calling for his blood. They're going to be calling for him to be crucified. They should accept him, but they will not. Their treatment of Jesus is sinful. They are going to be calling for the execution of an innocent man. The Holy Spirit will show that the Jews were wrong about Jesus. They're going to show that the world is wrong about Jesus, claiming that he is not who he is. The Spirit will be showing that the people who thought he was a sinner were, are actually sinners and wrong. So that's one thing the Spirit is going to do. 
The next, in verse 10, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Only the righteous can go to God. Only those who are without blame can be in the Father's presence. We we look into the Psalms and we have the, the rhetorical question about who can ascend God's holy hill, and only the righteous can do that. If Jesus goes to the Father, then it proves Jesus is righteous. And if he's righteous, then he's not a sinner. And so the Spirit is going to prove and show that they were wrong to think Jesus was a sinner because he is with the Father. If the Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus, then he is with the Father. That means he is righteous. That means they were wrong about him, calling him a sinner and someone who is leading the people astray. Finally, verse 11 tells us about judgment. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So the prince of this world is condemned. The ruler of this world, the one who has some control over this world, is condemned. The world is against Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is for Jesus. The world stands condemned before God the Father. So the Holy Spirit in this passage, we are told, has three functions. That the Holy Spirit, He is going to do three things. He is going to show that people were wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. We'll come back to that in a few moments, but keep that in your mind. Let's finish the last few verses, starting in verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus is not done telling his disciples what they need to know yet. Everything that they need to know. He's not done telling them that. But he has told them all that they can handle to this point. The Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth. Jesus, of course, as we know, is about to depart. Now, he's going to come back after the resurrection, and he'll be with his disciples for a time, but then he's going to ascend again. But the Spirit will be the one that continues Jesus' ministry and guides them into all truth. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. Why? Because he comes from Jesus and the Father. He brings to Jesus' disciples what he gets from Jesus himself. He is the conduit of continuing Jesus' ministry. The Spirit won't be at odds with the teaching of Jesus. We need to remember that. that The Spirit is going to reinforce and bring to mind what Jesus has already taught. It's not going to contradict Jesus' teaching. Now, that's dealing with our text I want us to look for a moment at some things that are very troubling in the world that calls itself Christian. You know, some people teach from church pulpits that if you're a Christian, everything is going to go well with your life. That that if your faith is strong enough, and if your faith is good enough, and if your faith is where it ought to be, then you're not going to have any problems. And the fact... The reason that you're poor is is because your faith isn't strong enough and you haven't unlocked the wealth and told it to come to you. Or the reason that you are sick is because your faith is not strong enough. If you were a better Christian, you wouldn't be sick. However, when you read what Jesus said, we see that the world is going to hate us because it also hated Him. When you look at what's on the television from supposedly Christian teachers you find a different kind of a story. I've got a little story I want to share with you here. There's there's a guy, and I don't know him. But you see the video. You can you can look it up on the computer if you'd like on YouTube. But there's, his name is Leroy Thompson. And there's a video of, of him from some large meeting that they had. Got thousands of people, it looks like, in the audience. And he's on stage in front of this large crowd. And he says to the people to pray and I'm going to quote him, money 
You don't belong to the wicked. You belong to us. And I want you to get into the right plan. Money cometh to me now. He's on stage and he says that. Saying, tell the money. It doesn't belong to the wicked. They can't have it. And he yells out, money cometh to me now. From the stage. Yells it out. And people are hooting and hollering. He went on to say, you are going to receive your money tonight in Jesus' name. From there, he said, listen to the Holy Ghost. He is going to set you free tonight. Come out from the balcony. Move with the Holy Ghost. Tonight is your breakthrough in Jesus' name. And again, he yelled, money cometh to me now. During this outrageous time, in the video, people started to run to the stage and throw cash down on the altar. They were cheering because this man told them that the Holy Spirit would bring them money from the hands of the wicked into the hands of the supposedly righteous. So you have someone who claims to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that is saying, you just tell that money to come to you. And if your faith is right, the Holy Spirit's going to bring the money out of the hands of the wicked and bring it to you. And your bills are going to get paid. And you're going to have the comforts. And you're going to have your nice car. Or you're going to have whatever it is that you want. You just tell that money to come to you. Yet if these people opened their Bible to John chapter 15, verses 20 and 21, they would find these verses that we just read. And I'll read them again. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Jesus tells his disciples that the world is going to hate them because of him. We are his followers today. Why would we think anything has changed? If Jesus told his disciples right before he was crucified, the world will hate you because of me, why do we seem to think today that the world is going to love us because of Jesus' name? That's not what he said. So let me give you a hint, church. If the world starts to love you, it might be just because whatever you're preaching is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people might preach the gospel of money. They might claim that you should ask God to send you money or that if you're a faithful believer, God will have money come to you. That might be an enticing idea, but that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some might preach a gospel of health. They might claim that if you are faithful, you will never be sick. You will never get cancer if you just believe in God enough. You'll never feel bad if your faith is strong enough, and, and, and then God will keep every danger or difficulty away from your house if you are just in line with the right teachings, and if you're just doing what God said, and if you're faithful enough, then God would protect you from everything. Now that may sound appealing, but that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ either. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not one of health or wealth, but one that tells us of a Savior that will never leave us. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not tell us we won't suffer, but it tells us Jesus endured suffering first and that he will be with us when we suffer. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not tell us we will be wealthy, but it tells us we have a treasure stored up in heaven where it cannot be corrupted. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not tell us our Lives cannot be taken by the world, but it tells us to take comfort because Jesus has overcome the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not tell us that we will have no troubles if we are faithful, but it tells us we have a faithful Savior that walks with us through the troubles and has a room prepared for us in the house of the Father. Church, I want you to hear that the gospel of Jesus Christ is much better than a gospel that tells us that we can simply call money to us. The Bible has a lot to say about money, but nothing like 
the fact that we could call money to us. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 read, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7-10, through 10, we also find Paul writing, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. If the gospel were simply about becoming rich, how sad that would be. Rich people die every day. Rich people lose wealth every day. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not about us having stuff, but about us having God as our Father and delighting in the riches of His glory. So Jesus tells us, church, that the world will hate us. We should not be surprised when it does. And when that happens, we have to remain in Christ despite difficulty. The Holy Spirit helps us to maintain faithfulness during times of persecution. The Holy Spirit is not a holy ATM to give us money for other things. He is our connection to God. He will show the truth about sin, righteousness, and judgment. He will prove Jesus and glorify Him. Now, I have a couple of questions for us here. For us to think about, Jesus is, is said... Now, he has been comforting his disciples, and he said, now, the world is going to hate you because of me. So, so here's the question I have for us to think about, church. Have we ever had the world hate us because of Jesus? Let's think about it for a moment. Have we ever had the world hate us as individuals or hate East Baptist because of Jesus? Now, let me, re, let me clarify a little bit. I'm not saying, I'm not asking, have we ever been rude or offensive to someone and they hated us because we were acting like a jerk? Okay, that's not what I'm asking. Have we ever been ugly or, or, uh, or just been offensive to someone and then they hated us and they would pretty much be justified in that case? I'm asking if we ever had the world hate us because of Jesus. Because of Jesus' name, have we ever had the world hate us and show that hate towards us? Now, I have been cursed at, yelled at, and spit at because I was sharing the gospel. I've been walking the streets of New Orleans in some of my seminary training. There were, there were people yelling at us, throwing things at us, spitting at us because we were sharing the gospel. But I've not really been hated. Okay, I've been tre treated perhaps rudely, but I've never really been hated. But have any of us ever been hated or persecuted because of the name of Jesus? If we think about that, and if our answer is, you yeah, probably not, the next question we need to ask ourselves is, why not? If, if we have not been hated by the world, I think there are probably two reasons why that would be. First, if we've not been hated by the world for Jesus' name, maybe it's because nobody realizes that we bear it. If the world hasn't hated us because of Jesus' name, maybe it's because they don't realize we believe in Jesus. Maybe it's like a tattoo that, that someone might have on their body, but they don't ever show it because they keep it covered up. You may never know they have a tattoo or maybe a, you know, a skin condition where, where you've got something that, that's going on, but nobody ever sees it because we keep it covered up. Maybe that's why. 
We may be followers of Jesus, but maybe it's more like a secret. People don't really know that we're followers of Jesus because maybe nothing in our life really shows it. Maybe we don't really do anything that makes us look like followers of Jesus. And and if we don't ever really do anything that makes us look like followers of Jesus, if we don't show that we're followers of Jesus, the world might not notice us. And if it doesn't notice us, it probably won't hate us. That's the reason why. If we've never been hated by the world, maybe it's because they couldn't recognize that we were followers of Jesus. The second reason might be, uh, if we have not been hated by the world for Jesus' name, maybe it's because we're actually part of the world. Maybe the world hasn't hated you because of Jesus because you don't actually belong to Jesus. The world would have no reason to hate you because you were a Christian if you're not a Christian. So if you've never been hated because of Jesus' name, We really ought to stop and think, why not? Now, a third possibility, and I guess there's probably a third logical possibility, is that where you live, you have only been around Christians. But we live in Lake City, so I don't think that's an issue. I don't think that we are only around Christians because this is where we live in Lake City. Unless you have a small little only Christian community that, that, that you live in, then maybe that would be the case. But Lake City isn't an only Christian place. And we're here now. And there are people around us as you go outside the doors, and we've got people that are not Christians. And not only outside the doors, there are plenty of non-Christians inside the doors of the church. In many of our churches on any given Sunday morning, we can find enough non-Christians to spare. And I'm not talking about just the visitors. Many on the rolls of our churches who attend maybe even have responsibilities or not believers. In fact, when I was in New Smyrna, and I don't want to take this as a swipe at deacons in any means there, but there were a couple of deacons in the church at New Smyrna that I was pretty sure we needed to find out if they were actually believers first. They were serving in positions in the church. And that's not to mention many of the others who were just members, that I was very doubtful of their salvation. There are lost outside of the church. Yeah, there are. There's lots of them. But there are also lost who are members of the churches, of our churches, and who attend. Maybe they attend every time the doors are open. But we need to make sure we check our motivations. Are we here this morning because of what being here gets us? Are we here because we desire to worship God and and serve Him? Are we here for what we get? Or are we here because we know we've got to worship God and we've got to serve Him? And and it doesn't really matter what it costs us, we're going to do it. Are we here because it's a status symbol or some kind of an obligation? Or are we here because Jesus saved us and changed our lives? We need to figure this out. Because if we are Jesus' people, we ought to look enough like Him that the world starts to hate us. Today, however... We don't really have that problem. I don't walk down the streets and the the jeers and the hissing and and to to people throwing stuff at me. We don't have people driving by and throwing stuff at our church and yelling at us or anything like that. So today we don't really have that problem. We don't have the problem of the world hating us because of Jesus' name. But you know what, church? The fact that we don't have that problem is a problem. The Holy Spirit, moving on a little, the Holy Spirit will also guide Jesus' followers, leading them to glorify Him. The final part of this passage is that the Holy Spirit will lead the church from within. I said the last time we were looking at this, we were looking at the, the idea of the Holy Spirit And I said that the the Holy Spirit universalizes the ministry of Jesus. That is to say, since the flesh and blood, blood body of Jesus can only be in one place at one time, the Holy Spirit, who is not flesh and blood, indwells God's people. The Holy Spirit is living in all believers. And through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is present to His people, the church. So because of the Holy Spirit, we can be intimately close with Jesus through the Holy Spirit's ministry. 
Jesus still is arisen in a physical flesh and blood body at the right hand of the Father, but we can be present to Him and He can be in our hearts and in our lives because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that connects us to Him. The Holy Spirit tells us the things He hears from Jesus. It is through the Holy Spirit that Jesus leads His church and is in His followers in a very real way. Jesus had to go so that the Holy Spirit would come, so that He could send Him and tell Him what to say. The church has been stronger, bolder, more powerful because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in believers. Another question just for us to think about as we're closing up is how close is our relationship with the Holy Spirit this morning? If you're a believer, then He has come to live in you and to tell you what Jesus has to say. He guides you. He's there for you to lead you into truth. Do you hear the Spirit? Do we experience the Holy Spirit in our lives? He will glorify Jesus and make Him better known to you. So do you have the Spirit in your life today? We've got a number of questions before us, and it's not easy questions, and for a Mother's Day sermon, probably not at all what we would have expected. But church, if we don't look enough like Jesus that it causes us some problems outside of our doors, then we just don't look enough like Jesus. And we need to make the changes that are going to make us look more like Jesus. And one of them is to be indwelled by the Spirit who will be transforming us and giving us the truth of Jesus' teachings in our lives to shape us to look more like Jesus. I've talked here about the idea that uh, the part of the, the way to summarize the ministry of the church is reach, relate, reflect. And I know I don't bring that up a whole lot, but the idea of reach is that we reach toward God in worship. Relate is that we relate to one another through our uh, doing lives together and, and loving and fellowship with one another. And the final one is that we reflect Jesus to the world like a mirror reflects light from it. If we reflect Jesus to the world, then we're going to be looking more like him. And the consequence of that is that people are going to start to not like us. But we have to be okay with that. Jesus has to be more important to us than what the world thinks of us. Because Jesus tells us here the world is going to hate us. And if we can't handle that, we need to rethink our relationship with our Savior. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you will let us follow Jesus faithfully despite the danger regardless of the risk let us be confident in your love O oh Father and the presence of Jesus who lives in us through the Holy Spirit Spirit we pray that you will continue to convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment we pray that you will continue to glorify Jesus and lead us to do that as well. Though the world will hate us, let us be faithful. Though it may cost us our lives, let us remain true. Do not let us be content to cover up our faith with the trappings of the world. Let us live our lives in bold colors for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it's in your name that I pray these things. Amen.